guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is R.V. Bergen. He is a veteran of World War II and a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. And sir, it's an honor to have you with us today. Yep. Where were you born and raised? It's here in Texas. And where's that in Texas? Oh, uh, Central Texas. When did you join the service? November the 13th, 1942. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Yeah, I enlisted. Okay. And uh, why did you pick the Marine Corps? It's the best uh, Sam had. <laughs> and where did you go to train? San Diego. What was that training like? I knew that they couldn't dish out anything that I can take. It was fast and furious. That San Diego sand, you take a step and slide back a half a step. <laughs> so they broke you down, but they made you better. That's what they do. They always bring re recruits in at night. They do that on purpose. Uh, this orientated, they are in charge. Did you ever think you wouldn't make it? Uh, no. When did you find out you were going to be trained on mortars? Out of boot camp. I went to Camp Elliott. I was put in on 60 mortars. Was that a hard thing to learn? No. What did, what did you have to learn? How to set the motor up, got the sights, base plate, the tube, and the bipod. If you shooting 1,000 yards or 500 yards, you uh, set the sights on the motor that distance, and then you make a adjustment uh, with the second round. I was on Okinawa one time, and uh, I knew about where this guy machine gun was, but uh, every time somebody uh, go across the valley, uh, Okinawa, one ridge, one valley, uh, one ridge, one valley, from the north to the south. I knew where he was, approximately where he was, and uh, the only way I could know for sure where he was at was let him shoot at me. And uh, I stepped out in his uh, range of fire, and uh, he put three holes in my dungarees and my left leg be between the, my knee and ankle and two bullet holes in my dungarees uh, in my right leg. But he didn't hit me. That's amazing. And yeah. you figured yeah. out where he was. Yeah. I could see the fire coming out of, his, out of the machine gun. I forward run around and uh, made an adjustment. and. I think that was the only direct hit that I made all the time on uh, Bellaloo and uh, Okinawa. Only direct hit I've ever done. And when I fired the first round, I made an adjustment, and uh, the next round got a direct hit. The machine gun went that way, and the Jap went that way. Wow. And we'll talk about those battles a little bit more in our conversation later. How fast could you set up a mortar? I could set a mortar up in seconds. And so then you were... Less than a minute. Impressive. Very impressive. So you were joined to the 5th Marines, correct? Yes. And what unit? K-35. What were your thoughts on that unit? The 5th Regiment is the most decorated regiment in the Marine Corps. So you fought with good men. Yeah. Where were you first deployed? To Melbourne, Australia. We were there for six months training with the Guadalcanal men, the Marines that just come off of Guadalcanal. And I would sit around and listen to their stories and ask questions. I wanted to know all I could know about what they did Marines did what the Japs did, so I wouldn't be walking into it just blind, not knowing what we did and uh, what the Japs did. They were good teachers. 
Well, they had certainly seen the worst of it yeah. at Guadalcanal. Yeah. After Melbourne, where did you go? I went to Melbourne Bay, New Guinea. Uh, stayed there for three months and then hit New Britain. And uh, I fought on New Britain December the 26th until May the 4th. I left the island May the 4th, 43. What was your experience in that first battle? The first night, uh, the land crabs uh, was crawling around uh, in the dry leaves and making a, a sound. I had a nervous night that night. We had just had a bad side charge late that afternoon, and uh, I thought they, they were Japs sneaking up on us, but it was only land crabs. <laughs> How intense was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was very intense. What was it like to be in combat for the first time? Awesome. Really? <laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had heard about uh, what the Marines did on Guadalcanal and uh, on New Britain, the uh, uh, first day, I was a gunner on a 60 millimeter motor, and all I had was a 45 attached to my hip. And uh, we had a little banzai charge that afternoon, uh, late that afternoon. And this guy had me picked out and come a running. He, he, he could have shot me numerous of times. But he wanted to bend at me, and uh, all I had was a forty-five, and I just let him come. And when he got about fifteen or twenty feet from me, I shot him in the chest, and uh, he fell backwards. Wow. With, with uh, that forty-five, got a knockdown power. We pulled back from the creek, and dug in up on the side of the hill. And that night, the land crabs kept me awake all night, rattling leaves. I thought the uh, gaps was coming. We just have about a minute before we take our first break. When you're on in your first combat, and it's finally come to a close, at least its first lull anyway, what does that feel like? Uh, yeah, relief. It's interesting that you found it thrilling uh, to be in combat. Did, <laughs> did you expect that? No, I didn't expect it. I guess the adrenaline flows when somebody's coming right at you with oh, a bayonet. Yeah. yeah. You had the better weapon, for sure. So, Mr. Bergen, let's take a quick break here. We are speaking with R.V. Bergen, a veteran of World War II and the U.S. Marine Corps. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by R.V. Bergen. He is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps and World War II. Pacific Theater, obviously, given his uh, Marine credentials. Sir, we were just talking about your first combat experience at the Battle of New Britain. Where did you go from there? Peleliu. And Peleliu is one of the yeah. fiercest battles of the Pacific Theater. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. They had uh, over 500 Ks in that Coral Island. Sometimes we were in places we c couldn't dig a foxhole. We'd f find chunks of rocks and uh, just pile them up around us for protection. We lost uh, 6,000 men uh, on that island, over 6,000, and the Army come in and relieved us, and they had over 2,000 casualties. Uh, that little two by six mile island with over 8,000 casualties, and uh, uh, there was a little island called Nicobus, uh about six, 800 yards off of the main island, and they had a, a something like a 150 caliber artillery piece over there, and uh, 
they were shelling the main island. We went over there and uh, one morning we set up beside a bunker. Sledge said, uh, Birkin, Birkin, there's Japs in there. I said, Sledge, you must be cracking up. Saunders said that bunker was clear. Saunders was a platoon sergeant. Uh, I don't give a damn what Saunders said. I hear them jabbered. <laughs> I eased up uh, beside the bunker and uh, they had a window with bars crossing about a foot in diameter. I eased up beside the pillbox of the bunker, leaned over and looked in the port and the chap had his face up in there looking out right next to the bars. I took my 45 and shot him point blank and uh, was just like kicking the beehive. Commotion going on and they had a ventilator uh, up in uh, the top of that thing and uh, we threw a numerous amount of hand grenades but they weren't doing any good. The bunker was about 15 or 20 foot long and had an entrance for both ends. In the bunker, they had concrete wall coming out about 18 or 20 inches and staggered. And one on this side here and one on that side staggered. And that's the reason hand grenades that were thrown in the, in the bunker wasn't doing any good. Uh, I went, run down to the beach and got a Amtrak with a 75 mounted on it. And uh, I brought him up, told him to call in that thing. We could get a flamethrower. And Charles Walmack was our flamethrower man. And I picked him up uh, on the way back. The Amtrak knocked a hole in it about uh, 30 inches in diameter, and uh, Charles Walmart let that flamethrower go off in there. And uh, they were either seven killed inside or seven killed outside, and there were 17 chaps in there. We, we killed all of them. Didn't get a man wounded. And uh, I guess everybody in the company knew because the company bypassed that uh, bunker. And uh, I guess everybody knew about the bunker. Captain Halladane asked me when we got back the second day uh, in the afternoon, Hammond Jap was in the, that bunker. And uh, I was 17 and uh, I told him how many was killed inside and how many outside, and uh, I didn't get a man wounded. He said, I'm going to put you here for Silver Star. But he got killed uh, October the 12th, and uh, that never happened. I did receive a bronze star. I don't know. Okay. Sir, let me have you pause right there. We'll be right back with R.V. Bergen on Veterans Chronicles. Thanks for being with us this week on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by World War II veteran R.V. Bergen. He is also a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, which is the branch he served in during the war. And, sir, you were just talking about your heroic actions on Peleliu and how you would have been submitted for a Silver Star had your superior officer survived uh, the battle. How long were you on Peleliu? Thirty days and nights. They'd come out of their caves at night and infiltrate the lines, marine lines. How would you describe the Japanese fighter? Ferocious, and uh, they fight to the death. They didn't uh, surrender? No. I think uh, I've seen uh, three Japs surrender on Okinawa, 
and they uh, come out of a cave in the, in their shorts and waving a white flag. The three of them. Pretty rare, that's, though. That's, uh, uh, that's only three Japs I've seen surrender. So after Peleliu, where did you go? Okinawa. Okinawa is next. I was on Okinawa April the 1st, October the 26th. The battle didn't go on that long, but uh, I was waiting to come home, uh, transportation to come home. We were on the north end of the island, and a Corsair come from the west and come down our street upside down. I believe he was low. He could stuck his hand out of a cockpit and touch the ground. <laughs> he come from the west, and uh, he did the victory or all going east. He turned around and come back and did the thing, same thing going west and did the victory roll. That's after the war was over. Let's go back to the beginning of Okinawa. What were you told to expect with that battle? Okinawa was the only place that I fought that had civilians. Okinawa was the last battle before we hit the Japan, and Japan was our next objective. I'm sure glad that they dropped the atomic bomb. Mm-hmm. Some people say that was terrible. I think it's the best decision in World War II, dropping that bomb. Uh, if we had hit Japan proper, there would have been thousands of us killed. Lord, uh, I don't know how many Jap- Japanese civilians and military men would have been killed, but it would have been terrible. Sir, you mentioned a little earlier that uh, you did earn a Bronze Star in the Battle of Okinawa. Can you tell us what happened that day? It was a machine gun. Uh, and he'd open up uh, every time we, the K Company would attempt to go across the valley. We'd uh, have to send stretcher bearers out and get, get the wounded. And uh, I knew approximately where it was, uh, but I didn't pinpoint him. Uh, I stepped out in his range of fire. And uh, he put three bullet holes in my left leg, uh, uh, my, uh, in my dungarees, but between my knee and ankle. And he put two bullet holes in in uh, my dungarees, uh, in my right leg. And I seen the fire coming out of the uh, barrel of my machine, uh, that machine gun. And uh, I fired around one round and made an adjustment. That's the only time that's, I can truly say that I got a direct, direct hit. So that was the incident you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. That was the machine gun nest that was causing so many problems. Yeah. How badly were you hurt? I spent 20 days in the hospital. And you went back to your unit? Yeah. I was a sergeant over uh, the 60 mortar section. Uh, it was important to me to, to get back to my men. I uh, was a sergeant and I was in charge of them. We had a first time lieutenant, first battle. He was from Maine. I had a lot of training to. <laughs> He used to sit around before we went into Okinawa, before we had and tell us what he's going to do. That's a veteran, so he just laughed at him. He said, uh, I'm going to put my GI knife in uh, my mouth 
in the charge of the Japanese. He he changed his mind after getting to combat. How much better do you think you were at your job by this time compared to back on New Britain? I had matured a, a lot. I was quite a bit better at handling men and uh, getting the job done and on Okinawa than I was at the other two battles, New Britain to battle of. So after the Battle of Okinawa, that's late April 1945, what did you do between then and the end of the war? I was on the north end of the Okinawa, and uh, I st- stayed there till the war was over. Then I came home. And what did you do after you got home? Made a career at the Dallas Post Office. Went as a substitute carrier, came at a superintendent. And you kept that job the rest of your career? Yeah. You also wrote a book, Islands of the Dam. Tell me about it. I don't know why it took me so long to write that book. Uh, I procrastinate a lot. (laughs) (laughs) My family had encouraged me to write a book. If not a book, write it down for your grandkids and great-grandkids to know what you did. I finally decided to write a book. The writer, Bill Marvel, uh, from the day he first came to the house, the book was out in one year. That's pretty fast. It is. It normally takes 18 months or two years. But we worked hard on the book. We wanted it to come out at the same time the Pacific did. Uh-huh. Uh, the Pacific came out, and my book came out the next day, vice versa. The Pacific was a miniseries on HBO, correct? Yeah. And you are depicted in that. Yeah, five, six, seven, nine, and ten. What kind of response did you get to the book? They printed 66,000, and it's on the Commodus reading list. I thought it was honor to my book to be on the Commodus reading list. It's got 10 books on his reading list, and uh, mine's number three. High praise. Just a couple minutes left in our conversation, sir. When you think about your time in service to our country, what comes to mind first, and what are you most proud of? I'm most proud that I've served in the Marines. Marines are the best, and Uncle Sam has. They get the job done. And the men that you served with? What do you think of when you think of them? All heroes, as far as I'm concerned. I never had a a Marine that quit on me, never. R.V. Bergen, he is a veteran of World War II and a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.